Okay, I'm Tim Ventura from American Anti-Gravity, and I'm speaking with Mark Beyer about a number of his projects with a focus on, I guess, the rank hilsch tube tesla turbine combination that he's working on. Well, Mark, thanks for joining us. I, I guess to, to launch right into it, you know, this is something we've talked about in the past, but this is a combination of two technologies that have a pretty solid history to them mm -hmm. that, that you're hoping to combine into a device that, that can do a lot more than either one alone. Can you describe it for us a little bit? Okay. First, um, those people who don't know the rank hills, just, it's called the Maxwell Demon or the Verbal, uh, verbal Roar. It uh, uh, was originally brought up by rank. He was a, an inventor that was building an, an air pump, and he determined that it had cryogenic, or sorry, had refrigerative properties. This air tube, by having air pushed in in a stream, in a tangent, across the, the flow, semi-restricted on one side would cause a flow to swirl going to, out the other, the other side. Well, then if you partly restrict the opposite side, it would rebound back and you'd have two counter-rotating streams. This created a near vacuum in the center, high pressure outside, so you've got heat on the outside, cool in the air, and it would kick it out, neck, neck, part out hot, part out cold. Well, so what you have then is adiabatic, well, cold and hot. You know, one of the things input. that's interesting about this, and, and, and I'll, I'll put up some links on the website to this, I, I did a story last summer about something called the Geet engine. And it looks like he's made some modifications to the principle. But Paul Pantone, who, who has had he, he's had some difficulties, I guess, in his career, looks like he capitalized on this rank hilsch technology. Now, in his case, what he was able to do is move combustion from an internal combustion engine, like he used a two-cylinder lawnmower engine. He moved it out to the rank hilsch tube. So the actual combustion happens in the tube. And I guess the idea in his case was that the heat separation between incoming and outgoing was so great that he was able to create a true plasma instead of a standard combustion cycle. Well, the GEET system, which he uses in there, does take into account the, the near vacuum of the vortex. But in the principle of the, of the rank hills, I think once you've looked at both of them, there is distinct differences in those. Uh, the rank hills as I was saying, was originally developed by Rank, and then Hills came back and did further work on it. It actually was developed like the Tesla turbine was developed before World War II. Okay, the uh, Hills actually put further work into it, and during World War II, there was some limited applications of it by the Germans. So it was one of those German war devices that was a miracle device. Mm, okay. Afterwards, it wasn't really developed on because they could never get it quite to tune properly. It has a high potential. The, the potential is supposedly that you can pull liquid nitrogen out of one side and mm. pull um, uh, boiling temperature out of the other side. Yeah. So you're talking about you know, a 500 degree difference in temperature. And th that is supposed to be the, the mathematical potential. What they've actually achieved is closer to about a minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit with a positive 212 degrees Fahrenheit out the other side. A lot so of that's tuning, right? Yeah, it's, it's actually a tuning thing. They've, they've tried different things in it. They've tried um, looking into the, the sound aspects of it, which there's actually a professor at University of Washington who's well known for his work in that. And they've also looked at, at efforts into reversing the adiabatic system and understanding the adiabatic system better. They've tried many different ways, including making a single output instead of a dual output. So it go, everything goes out in one direction instead of going out, having, having to back feed. Oh, okay. So there okay. is something. And that's where it really starts getting interesting. When you look at, at, the, at the efforts to make the, the reversal of the adiabatic system, which means that you want a high pressure in the center with a low pressure to the outside, the, the efforts that they did in this was actually to take this the, this near vortex and inject an acetylene gas into it. When they injected an acetylene gas in it, they could then burn the acetylene gas. Well, the vortex inside actually produced a near perfect burn in it, which is highly unusual. And as you know from our previous conversation, this is where it really caught my attention because the numbers didn't look right. When you burn acetylene in a in a regular torch, you're talking about 54 to 5600 degrees of temperature. When you look at a at burning uh, acetylene in a rank hill uh, under the, the system that they're working with, they're pulling almost 400 to 600 degrees higher. And there was some difference in the, the testing and the actual injection points that gave this variation. But because of this, that means this oxyacetylene torch is 5,400 degrees, which is supposed to be a perfect burn because of perfect oxidizer, is actually burning lower 
than what they're using r normal room mirror. Yeah. Now, now, so so does this device create? Would it be fair to say that there is a plasma reaction in there? I, I wouldn't say that's a plasma reaction. More so than I would say that it comes into the the near vacuum state, mm, allows okay. for a better diffusion, and, and it also is. They, they've had a conjecture about what actually causes the dynamics of the adiabatics, and give me just a second to describe this. In a tornado, a tornado actually has, if anybody has seen the movie um, Twister, in the movie Twister they show a really good idea of a tornado when they're looking up, um, they're looking up inside the, the tornado when they're tied to that pump. And they're sure. looking up and they actually see two tor they two see a twister, a vapor trail on the inside and they see the, the, the rim wall outside as it passes over them. And they look up and they see blue, blue sky above. That is a good representation of the two vortexes rotating inside of each other. But they have to have a transfer mechanism. And there's actually believed to be between five and six micro vortexes that roll like bearings in between them. They're called air veins. And there are those who speculate on this. Those air veins then get distorted into an oval. So they're off-centered like a cam in the rotation principle, which creates a high on one side and a low on other side. Okay. Pressure, okay. which then allows them to capture heat and move the heat as it goes. So in a traditional rank health vortex tube, they take the heat from the inside where they capture it and then they compress it to the other side, which is now your outside, and it transfers that heat out to the outside layer. So when you do this, it, it creates this, this adiabatic system, this cross flow of heat. And as it rotates, it actually rotates inside there just like bearings would inside of a bearing on, on an axle. Now take this and reverse it. You've now put something that creates a high heat on the inside and your low heat's on the outside. You've got high pressure on the inside, low pressure on the outside. You flip the bearings. So now it's transferring heat the opposite direction. Okay. By transferring that heat, you've now created the ability to to move to to uh, focus your heat to the inside and keep the heat away from the outside. They say at 6,000 degrees you can reach out and grab the outer wall of this thing in its room temperature. So you're talking about a 6,000 degree difference, or you know, just shy of a 6,000 degree difference that's comfortable to grab the outside of it. Yeah. So they're building yeah. these things out of out of aluminum. That were before they you having to use high t high temperature steels and sure and stainless steel. Well, n now so this this system and and I, I guess one of the unfortunately one of my complaints about the Geat engine be, being being aware that there are some differences between what you're proposing and the, the Rank Hills tube and then the Geat. But mm -hmm. one of my one of my worries there was they had this constant flow system, right? They have air coming in one side, they have mm -hmm. air coming out the other. It's constant flow connected to basically a cylinder that's going up and down. Mm -hmm. Now you're proposing something that capitalizes on the fact that this is a constant flow system, right? Which is the Tesla turbine, yes. which which also happens to be well over, if I remember correctly, well over 90% efficient, isn't yes. it? Yes. You're taking now, obviously with this, with the Rank Hills where it's burning extremely high efficiency on it, that it's actually acting as if it's a turbine engine itself. And it's allowing itself almost like a pre, like a mixing stage on a regular turbine, and it's taking that and putting the hot gas, in which they've always had problems with your Tesla turbine, of getting it to where it's throttleable. It's no, it's not a high reaction system because of the viscosity acts on the surface, it, so it acts in a viscosity action. Um, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. You know, it, uh, Coriolis effect, Coriander effect, Coriander effect. So by causing this effect, it, it takes a while to catch up with whatever speed of anything increasing across it. But it needs the airflow to move, to vary, to be able to do this. The, the, the burn diodes that they used the Tesla originally came up with were highly efficient, but unfortunately it could not go, it was not throttleable. The, the Rank Health really looks like it's a throttleable solution to this. The Tesla turbine is durable. That's, that's what you need. And be, now, would, it, would the heat pass from the Rank Hills tube into the Tesla turbine? Actually, it would, but it's going to be buffered from the fact that, the, the, you know, you're talking about a mixed air coming into it. But that, that's for an engine. We're, now, we're talking about something that's basically a multi-fuel engine at this point. You're taking whatever you're injecting in in a flammable liquid or gas into the Rank Hills to burn to power your Tesla turbine. But see, the Rank Hills has a unique has a unique problem of it. It requires 14.6 pounds of air, air pressure going in on a constant rate to be able, in a great enough volume to be able to spin up the air inside of it to produce the vortex. Okay. 
but it puts it out in a manner that we can tell tap off a tesla turbine well tesla turbine also makes a fan so if you two stage your tesla turbine the tesla turbine can actually provide the air to go in to run the to start up so you're actually talking about in a sense almost a new kind of jet engine right yes i am which i'll get to i'll get to the various ways that this can be used in just a second that what's really cool is by being able to spin up it can spin up that that vort rankhouse vortex tube get it up to an operating state to be able to inject the gases now obviously you have to have an external motor to do that probably electric of course of some sort by spinning it up it gets the the, the tube working the tube then goes and fires the fire off the tube then goes back into the tesla turbine and as a high efficiency system up to 92 percent efficient in transferring mechanical uh, the heat the the rotational energy into a mechanical form it takes off the energy back into whatever was driving it, which it might be a, a motor generator, which now electric motor generator. So now you've got yourself a high energy, uh, motor, uh, high energy uh, hybrid electric system. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, well. Now, in terms of fuels, I mean, and and again, I think the durability aspect of this really comes into it. Um, one of the things that I read about a while ago was actually. Um, Sometimes gasoline, especially when you have alcohol mixed with the gasoline, can take mm -hmm. a little bit of water into the gas with it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that was one of the complaints about adding alcohol as kind of a, one of the clean emissions things, was that mm -hmm. all of a sudden gas and water can mix, which is generally bad. But one of the things that had surprised me was it was bad because it was damaging the equipment. It's bad because it's hard on the cylinders, it's hard on the rings, which aren't meant for anything that can really cause corrosion. But the water itself has a steam reaction that expands like crazy when it gets hot. Exactly. So you're talking about 6,000 degrees, but not only that, something durable enough that you can experiment with other types of fuels. Exactly. Where it doesn't have to be pure refined gas. You could have gas that might be a little bit dirty, a little bit mixed with something else. Methane, it, it, anything that literally that burns. You can even do it in a hydrogen embrittlement system, which is, you know, as you know, the, G, the GEET system and all the other ones have always talked about, even the hydrogen cracking has always talked about the problems they've got with hydrogen embrittlement. In this case, you're talking about a metal plate, a spinning metal plate. The Rankhill's vortex has no moving parts. So, you know, who cares about hydrogen embrittlement? The, air, the vortex on the center is going to prevent the hydrogen from interacting with the metal surface. It's, your, it's the plates themselves that are actually going to take it in the Tesla stages, and that's only on the output, and those are easily replaced. Sure. And, you know, what, are they, what happens if they abrade? They abrade out through, you know, 15 billion rotations, and then you just replace them out when they hit so many rotations because you know that at that point you've hit, hit an embrittlement level that beyond that's unsafe. Well, and this, I guess, brings up another aspect is that one of the advantages of the test turbine is not, not only is it durable, but it's also a lot simpler, right? I mean, oh, replacing yes. it would mean taking off an end cap, maybe replacing a bearing and a few blades as opposed to an engine where you're, you're, you know, undoing God knows how many screws and bolts, taking off the manifold, taking off the carburetor, and then hoping that it goes back together correctly. Exactly. See, that's one of the things. Is this this system? These are two forgotten technology that basically passed people by, and everybody has has. You've had people who've worked on them, and you've had investors work on them, and sometimes they've actually been scared on. Uh, it's there's different parts of these that they complement each other so much. If you take a look at the the Tesla turbine as a fan actually produces a laminar airflow when, around the outside of the casing or actually around the inside of the outer of the, the casing when you spin it. So you bring your air in so, alongside the axis, it goes out the outside, produces a laminar airflow. You then take your, te your, your uh, vortex tube, bring the vortex tube alongside of it and what do you have? You have large area, small area, large gear, small gear. It becomes an air gear system, which means you don't need that high air pressure. You've got high air movement. Brings it in, it rotates around, and when it comes back out, comes out in a jet that then can be ducted in at the angle that's necessary for the test to determine. Closed system, yes, you still have exhaust, you still have an intake on it, but it's also high durability. So you're talking about something that can be put in any environment and it would be, work very, very well. Yeah, yeah, now, well, and, and aircraft would definitely be one concept. You know, the, the jet engine so dominates today's jet world, but one of the things, I ran into this with the Vortex thruster, mm -hmm. was the, the aircraft industry is struggling in the area of VTOL aircraft. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it, well, part of the struggle is they don't yet realize some of the challenges. For instance, the, the Vortex thruster, uh, as, a, as a coand effect, mm -hmm. it's a Vortex-based device, Yes. Um, it doesn't require external fans. It doesn't require a fan that can get jammed up if something falls into it. 
And it actually took a while to get that idea through to some of the engineers that I know. They, they were looking at it saying, well, this works pretty good, but why would I want to use this instead of a helicopter rotor? Well, the simple answer that I had was, well, power lines. That's the reason why, because helicopter rotor hits anything and it's gone. Whereas with the Vortex Thruster, you get a second chance. So in terms of engines, you're talking about something similar, where you're operating in the desert, you're operating in salt air, right, for naval stuff. Exactly. You're operating in all these different kinds of environments, with all sorts of unknown factors involved. You've got something that runs hot enough that hopefully it gasifies or destroys most of your impurities, and if not, hopefully it'll pass it through without too much damage. Sand. Sand would mean nothing to this dust. It would just eat it up, spit it out. Wouldn't even care about it. You'd have a higher, higher rate of burn on, on your plates, but as um, Tesla pointed out, when he was actually built the, the turbines and he was using them for power production, they, were, they had turbines that were right next to the vein style turbines, and the vein style turbines they would shake, they would have actually special compartments to pull the broken veins out on these steam turbines that they were using. And he was using steel turbines that were taking, I mean, direct water blasts onto them because of, mis of being misadjusted and they still were taking it without going being damaged at all. Yeah, yeah. So, but one of the things that you're looking at, you mentioned this vortex thruster. In the vortex thruster, you probably run into the same problem which almost every engineer has tried to come up with a solution for a jet engine is. A jet engine, as we know it, a vane type jet engine in, a, in a, an airplane, is capable of a wide range of speeds. It can, it, once it gets up to a basic operating rotation, you can run that thing up to incredible speeds and back down again, and you can also supplement it with afterburners, sure, sure. Or, or with uh, with takeoff and a, a cam type system to go and run a propeller on it for other types of things. So there's different things, but when you try and bring your vortex thruster in, the the range it, it fits within the range, but that might not be the range that that amp, that they're looking for for their engines. Well, that's what I'm looking at for. This, for this system, by combining the two, you actually produce the ability to go from a st from a stop, clear up into extremely high speeds of outflow of air. Yeah. Well, w would you say that this would be a high torque, high speed system? Because one of the one of the worries with with and again the vortex thruster came into this. Again, the, the engineering industry in terms of you know the, the high end aircraft design, mm -hmm. they have been with the jet turbine, which is a very high RPM, very low torque device for so long that, that they don't even think in terms of that. They think of, well, for instance, your, your uh, turbo-powered helicopter, right? Mm -hmm. They think in terms of, let's run, let's run uh, our turbine up to 30,000, 50,000 RPM or higher, mm -hmm. and then let's do a reduction gearing system on it to turn a rotor that only needs to go 200 RPM. Well, it's a great idea, except you're burning a lot of fuel. You're running yes. at 50,000, you're burning enough fuel that you could you know, fly a small jet fighter, and at the same time, you're spinning a prop that doesn't need it. What it needed in the first place was torque. Exactly. So the, the only, I think, in, in my opinion, the only reason that that's done is that your your turbine systems are lighter weight than like a V8 or a V12 or you know whatever they might use in terms of internal combustion, but but not necessarily efficient. Now I could be mistaken there. I know there are a lot of variations, and they're using smaller turbines than a jet would. But Actually, I, yes. I'm wondering if this device might be a replacement for something like a helicopter where they, they need more torque and, and quite frankly it uses too much fuel for high RPM. Well, the problem you'd have you'd have then would how would you take off the torque? And obviously the Tesla turbine does solve that as an output. So it could be a replacement for it. The the cool thing about this is is you're not going to be using stainless steel. You're not going to be using heavy steels, high carbide steels. You're going to be using aluminum. And you're probably going to be using very inexpensive aluminum. It's not going to be incredibly thick walled. Uh, remember, all, all your pressure off of this is going to be, at least in the, the Rank Hill section of it, is room temperature external flow, and it's buffered by multiple layers of air, by yeah, the lamina. Yeah. So you've got the outer, the inner vortex is the one that's going to be taking all the heavy hitting. The outer vortex is the one that's going to be colder, and it's going to be up against the metal with those micro vortexes going and taking any shocks that hit it. So if you get a sudden shock from a sudden airflow, impact into it, it th they're going to actually expand the inner one against the outer one with those with those bearings going and taking the worst of the head. Well, well, how do you think this might stack up to a conventional turbine engine in terms of fuel efficiency? I'd say it's probably going to be significantly higher. I Unfortunately, I'm not at a Kate's point right now to say how high, but take a look at your difference in between the oxyacetylene torch, which is a pure burn, and your... And your um, the, the vortex tube in the, in the reverse adiabatic system. Yeah, it's much much better. So you're ta if you can compare that in a burn and give it a rough estimate, you're talking about 10 to 12 percent. And 
they already look at a turbine system with the way it burns with a gas turbine jet engine conventional jet engine as being already being a high 80 percent system plus so you know you're talking 10 percent it's going to be pretty big there you know because you just don't have much more to go with it yeah now, now is it easier to switch fuels also I, I as i understand it even some of the automakers now ford i think just came out with something called the flex fuel system mm -hmm. where you can run it off of apparently a variety of mixtures and, and it will automatically tune itself to figure out what it's using. Mm -hmm. um, do you think this might be more amenable to that? And again, from a, from a military perspective of operating in different environments, right? We're It'd probably run on anything. I mean, it's just a matter of, of uh, putting the fuel in in the right mixture amount. And if you've got a, an injection system, you can have multiple injectors because what's really funny about this is they actually inject it around the outside of the tube. They don't inject it around the inside. The Going back to your simplification of design, what you were talking about, this in compared to a normal jet engine would be significantly smaller. But I have to caution you that the, vo the vortex tube is not big. The, I'm not talking about a vortex tube that's going to be feet across. This is a vortex tube that's inches across, so what you have is a layer of vortex tubes around the outside of a Tesla turbine. Yeah, the, I, I'd so it looks that with the, unusual. I noticed that with the GEED engine also, you know, when you when you think of combustion chamber, right, and, and again in that case it, it is a little bit different than what you're proposing, but you know, the, the combustion was happening in this, in this basically this plasma vortex device. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that took me by surprise was the actual piston itself, right? A two cylinder, you know, yeah, two stroke engine, four stroke engine, two cylinder engine. Mm -hmm. You've got a piston that maybe, I don't know, two, two and a half inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yet, you know, when you, when you look at the tube, this tube was three quarters of an inch, I think, if that. Probably. So, I can, so I can easily see that. Yeah, yes. and, and it's longer while being thinner, which again I think is good for aerodynamic shapes because everything we do is kind of too mm -hmm. shaped. So. But it's also going to be much shorter. The actual overall engine on this would probably be the same size as what the, what the, the vortex tube has already been decide, determined at. And there's a specific ratio on that that goes for the exact size that they've found so far. But when you put that together, I believe that you'll find that that size right there works very well. Now, there's certain things about the vortex tube, and we're going back, way back to the start of our conversation, about problems they've had with it. If any free vortex article I've managed to find so far points to the fact that they've never tried to go and separate the inner and outer vortex to allow the inner vortex to, to evacuate properly. There's a mixing. And that mixing produces lowering of efficiency. Sure. That's why I think they've been having problems. But now, can't some of that be, be solved by flow speed? Because one of the keys to the vortex thruster was the flow separation comes from the higher RPM. Mm -hmm. So, Well, you're going to see part of that, but you're still going to see a back backflow because it, it's natu natural for there to be a spray out. And when the spray comes out of any type of a nozzle, especially into a system like this, Part of it is going to back feed into, it's going to curl. They actually have a diagram, it's a simplified diagram, showing how the flows go inside of the system. And you do see quite a bit of mixing with the, intern, with the output and the input. The hot, I should say, the internal vortex and your input jet. And because of that, it causes your, your um, in, internal vortex to become diluted. And I believe that's where they've been having their big problems. That and also they uh, have dimpling issues and they haven't really fully investigated this reverse adiabatic system as much as what I think they should. Mm, okay, so there's still some work to be done. but There's a lot. Well, with, with people interested in learning more or potentially even trying to build one of their own, is there a good resource that you'd recommend online? Well, there is. Unfortunately, I don't have those articles with me, but I'll forward them to you and you can always add them oh, into sure, your article. Oh, sure, sure. There's... Um, one other thing to look at this, nobody really knows how fast of an airflow that one of these can take. I mean, yes, it operates very efficiently, but once you start talking about being able to transfer the airflows, how fast of an airflow can one of these take? Does it get more efficient? Does it get less efficient? Does it break down the vortexes? I fir firmly believe that it doesn't break down those vortexes, that it actually causes those air, air bangs to spin at a higher rate, just like any other tor vein system would. But think about this. This is a vein system that's not limited by mechanics. There's no moving parts in it. Yeah, it's a good point. So it's possible that, you know, unlike, you know, well, I guess it's possible that the faster you travel in this thing, the more efficient it might get, possibly. Might get, and also the, the fact that it might be able to take a shock wave without going and breaking off a vein because the veins are made out of air. 
Yeah. So yeah. It's, it might be possible that this may be the first scramjet that's capable of going from sub from actually a standing stop through sub uh, through subsonic to supersonic and on on up without having to go in transition between different aspects of the engine.